Once again, I want to thank Professor Pillai for a very, very generous and warm introduction uh, and for teaching me about Kerala. Your region is uh, really wonderful, but mainly not just because of beauty, but because of the people. Uh, I think we have experienced uh, such generosity and kindness of spirit uh, as, more than I've ever seen in my life, I think, uh, in this region. The people are so nice. Uh, I know there's uh, time constraints, so I may have to talk a little faster than I thought, but try to bear with me. What I present is not complicated. It's not details of our work. I did a little more of that yesterday, talking about the story of HIV and how it evolved in our laboratory, etc. But today I'm going to speak more generally with just a few overlapping slides from yesterday. I'm going to try to go through some of the dangers of viruses today and then really focus on what Professor Pillai introduced to you, the Global Virus Network. But first, let's start with very basic stuff that would go to a medical student. Microbial pathogens. We want to focus on viruses, of course, and the only purpose of this slide is to remind you of how small they are and that, you, as you all know, you cannot see a virus by standard microscopy. We need the electron microscope for a 50,000 or more fold magnification. The other purpose of this slide is, again, a reminder to say that unlike other microbes, viruses do not have any metabolism. They're just pieces of genetic information covered by protein layers for protection. Therefore, a virus is what we refer to as an obligate intracellular parasite, meaning they replicate, they reproduce only through using our cellular machinery, proteins, enzymes, etc. Yes, yes, they carry a few genes of their own that are essential in the virus replication cycle. It is important to recognize that it was thought that one could never treat a virus because it doesn't have a metabolism, such as a bacteria, a fungus, a, a, a protozoan parasite, and so on. So how could you ever treat a viral disease? With HIV and AIDS, we have a medical history in that we learned from molecular biology that we could precisely define the steps in the replication of a variety of viruses, including retroviruses, which HIV is. And so we were able to specifically target, like a laser beam, a step in the virus's replication cycle. This led to the great therapy we have for HIV and AIDS today, and has opened the door to the treatment by, with the pharmaceutical industry rushing into the field now uh, of other viral diseases. I mentioned yesterday Hepatitis C virus, which is a significant problem for the whole world, it is estimated that in the next few years, we won't see it anymore. It will be cured. This is due to drugs uh, that are coming from a few pharmaceutical companies, especially one called Gilead. And I, it's uh, happy for me to say that another, uh, another native of Kerala, we just recruited to our institute and is a tremendous expert on the clinical science of hepatitis C virus. His name is Shyam Kotalil. Uh, and I repeat again, hepatitis C virus should not be a problem in another three or four years. We think in the next few years, for example, it should be pretty much wiped out in, inf in the United States. Though there's no vaccine, if you're infected, there will be curative therapy. Virology went through different periods, of course, like any science. We can divide the periods according to technological advances. At the beginning, the 18, late 1800s to really several decades into the 20th century, the only way we knew about a virus is if we took a tissue from a person who had a disease and you made extracts of the tissue, you filtered it, so that anything as large as a bacteria or a fungus or a parasite would be excluded. And what came through the fil filter, the filtrate, when inoculated into some animal, 
produce disease. Now that's not a very good way of looking for a virus because most viruses may not infect the species that you're using as your test animal. But that was the beginning of virology. In fact, the name virus comes from the Romans, from Latin. It means poison. That's it. And then we had electron microscopy around the 1940s, and that allowed us to see viruses for the first time. That is, if the virus genes were fully expressed and the virus fully formed. But it's not a very sensitive technique. It's very limited to who has an electron microscope and who has the expertise to see the virus. And again, I repeat, it's not at all sensitive. By the 1950s, we have a new era. This is simultaneously immunological approaches to define virus infections, including antibodies, specific antibodies, in the serum of an infected person, but also antibodies that could determine the kinds of proteins making up the virus. Biochemical techniques allowed us to determine that, the, that viruses had either DNA or RNA. In time, we would learn that it was either DNA or RNA that was their genetic information. Around the same time, the, the technology of tissue culturing developed. This means we could grow viruses in cells in the laboratory under culture conditions with the proper nutrient broths. Roughly the 1970s, early 1970s, begins the current era, the era of molecular virology. And this, as I mentioned already, allowed us to determine the very steps in the virus reproductive cycle, the replication cycle. Large-scale viral infections can be of three types. When we refer to an endemic infection, we mean a virus that's been in a population for a long time. It's endemic in the population. It, nothing new is occurring. It's the standard disease, the standard percent, the, about the same. Epidemic simply refers to the development of a higher rate of infection of something we know about or maybe something we don't yet know about, like when AIDS came. Pandemic is when it becomes global, of course. Now, how do you get a new virus infection? What, when something new comes, how does it happen? Almost always, it's enzootic infection. That is, it went from an animal to man. The case of AIDS and HIV is a case in point. HIV came into man from African chimpanzees in rainforests about 100 to 150 years ago. Or it can be a recently recognized old infection. For example, the leukemia virus uh, that was referred to in the introduction, the human T-cell leukemia viruses number one and number two that we discovered in the late 1970s and reported in the early 1980s. Those are old, ancient infections of man, again from monkeys, but it's old and established, and the virus became endemic in several parts of the world. I'll come to that again in a moment. Another way we can have a new virus infection or a new epidemic is a recent mutation in an old, known viral infection of humans, promoting a new pathogenic effect. A good example of that might be polio. Polio is thought to be originating from a virus known as a Coxsackie virus, and then it mutated to a form that allowed it to become neurotropic, targeting cells of the nervous system. But you just heard the nice talk about influenza, influenza A and influenza B. And influenza, you heard that we have to be vaccinated every year because there's new strains, there's genetic reassortment going on, and we face a different challenge annually. Okay, well, I said HIV came to us as a new infection from a chimpanzee, but it's probably true that there was also some mutations that allowed it to start spreading from human to human. Because I said this would happen maybe 100 to 120, 130, 150 years ago. We can actually determine that by knowing the rate of genetic change of the RNA genome of HIV over the period of time. We know when it came into man, but we know when it came into man and became epidemic. Clearly, hunters in Africa, rainforests, were 
pro like, uh, likely, not likely, surely they had contaminations from monkeys and chimpanzees before, from bites, from uh, when you clean the animal for food, from getting cuts, but we didn't have the beginning of an epidemic. So those people died in the rainforest with their virus, or the virus didn't mutate enough to be sufficiently infectious from human to human. So it's possible there was also a key mutation that gave rise to the AIDS epidemic uh, in that period. In general though, epidemics or pandemics occur because of a change in society. Always think about change when you face a new problem. For example, in the Roman times in Europe, in the Mediterranean, when the Romans opened up new ports in the Mediterranean Sea, there were new epidemics. When Columbus came to the Americas, there were new epidemics for the American Indians, and uh, many microbiologists believe that Columbus's uh, sailors brought back syphilis to Europe. Air conditioning gives rise to Legionnaire's disease. Climate changes and movement of populations, the medical use of blood, air travel, like me coming here from the United States, and other new ways for people and insects to get around. I said a great example is HIV post-World War II. What did we have? We had much more travel by t for tourism, increased sexual contacts, the global development of intravenous drug abuse, the insanity of that, and medical blood products moving from one nation to another nation. For example, in Japan, they don't use their own blood. They use blood from the United States or Europe. And I witnessed the Japanese epidemic in hemophiliacs going from nothing to 20% of the clinic in Tokyo in a matter of just three months from using foreign blood. The three great pandemics in the in the twenty three of the, of the great pandemics in the twentieth century, I highlight here were influenza of nineteen eighteen, nineteen nineteen, polio of nineteen fifties, and AIDS beginning was recognized in the nineteen eighties. Though the epidemic was off and running certainly by the sixties and seventies. In it, my experience with HIV and reading the history of polio and influenza gave me the view that we humans have only a 25 to 30 year memory span. The influenza epidemic in 1918, 1919, people were talking about before that epidemic occurred that we should be studying only chronic degenerative diseases. Ironically, some can be caused by viruses. But in other words, the age of serious epidemics was over. And then if you read the history of polio, uh, the, there's a book by a man named David Oshinsky, a historian from uh, New York University uh, described exactly the same thing in the early 1950s when polio epidemic was appearing in America. Just before that, the arguments were we should forget about serious epidemic diseases because they're no longer a problem. They're only a problem for those people. What people? People in the tropics. There was no real interest anymore. That was the feeling today that would be very politically incorrect, but it was also very wrong. HIV, when it was first recognized in the United States by clinicians on the East and West Coast in 1981, uh, I can tell you that in the 1970s, again, the lessons of the previous epidemics uh, were forgotten. The previous epidemic being polio, again, about 30 years later. So we had the following attitude, oh, excuse me, we had the following attitudes that serious epidemic diseases are over in the industrialized world. Therefore, we can forget about them. If you want evidence for that, in the United States, some famous medical schools terminated their departments of microbiology. There was also a strong bias that certain types of viruses, such as retroviruses, do not infect humans and that there were many reasons for this. I bring that up because this was a period that I kind of suffered because in the 1970s we were getting evidence that retroviruses might be present in humans. This was an extremely unpopular notion. That is a good discussion for students, not so much for you, to highlight the fact that my first paper on the discovery of the first human retrovirus, the leukemia virus, HTLV-1, was rejected. I have the letter 
in a frame on my wall, more or less telling me, go away, everybody knows it's not true. So that was uh, interesting. And the third point is that no virus has caused cancer in humans or even plays a role in any human cancer. Evidence for my statement, 1974 Cold Spring Harbor, the origins of human cancer meeting, a book came out, no viruses are involved in any human cancer. Well, as you all know, these biases were destroyed in the early 1980s. Viruses are now known to be the cause or involved in the cause of about 20% of all human cancer. Retroviruses were discovered in humans, shown to cause some leukemias and fatal neurological disease. And last on the slide, one of the great pandemics of history, AIDS appeared, and it's caused by another retrovirus. Now, uh, I want to uh, come back to AIDS in a moment when we discuss Ebola. Oh, well, I'm going to speak a little bit about it now. So human retrovirus is known only since we published in 1980 on HTLV and later in HIVs. What is special about a retrovirus? Remember, it's genetic information is RNA, but so is polio, so is flu. So that's not what's different. What's critical of the definition of a retrovirus is that it carries a special DNA polymerase known as reverse transcriptase that converts the RNA to DNA, but that DNA form integrates that's the key problem, integration into our chromosomal DNA of the targeted cell. So that means that this happens within a day or two, infection is established forever. So once infected, you can't get rid of it. It's in your genes, in the target cell, and in the descendants of those cells. Thus, any discussion of an HIV vaccine means that the immune response has to stay all the time, a unique requirement in the history of vaccinology. There's no time for an immune recall. Contrast that with polio, for example. Everyone here is vaccinated against polio, I assume. But if we all drank polio virus today, we get infected. But the immune system will be remembering it's been vaccinated. It recalls this develops an immune response, the polio is cleared from the gastrointestinal tract because poliovirus is an enterovirus. It goes to our gastrointestinal tract. But by the time it's ready to go to the nervous system, it's cleared by the vaccine. Not true with HIV, after one day it's too late. We have no time for recall. HTLV-1 and 2 cause diseases, but HTLV-1 much more. They cause adult T-cell leukemia and also a fatal paralytic disease, formerly referred to as tropical spastic paraparesis. They can also cause modest immune deficiency, immune dysregulation that sometimes also can lead to some autoimmune disease. As I mentioned, HTLVs are an ancient infection of man coming from African and Asian monkey viruses, known as simian T-cell leukemia viruses. Very old, but newly discovered. HTLV is endemic in Japan, especially the south, in Iran, in Aboriginal Australians, in natives of Indonesia, some of them, in good parts of equatorial Africa, in African descendants in all of the Americas, in South America, in black and native populations, especially Brazil, Colombia, Venezuela, and Peru, but low prevalence in most of the rest of the world, though in many regions it has yet to be fully studied. For example, and importantly for here, I don't think we know a great deal about the prevalence of HTLV in India. Maybe so, there have been some regional studies, but not adequate. HIV is the greatest new pandemic. About 38 million people are dead. About 36 million people are infected now. The disease and the, the virus pioneered new blood testing. It was nice to hear my colleague, Dr. Sangadaran from Kerala mention. He was critical, my critical coworker, in the development of the HIV blood test. Also, HIV research pioneered antivirus therapy, proving that a virus could be targeted if we are sufficiently intelligent. Yet, many people are infected without knowing it. In the United States, the CDC says that about 20% 20, 20 of all HIV-infected people don't even know it. Another 20% do not adhere to the medication, so this is not a solved problem even in America. 
It's certainly a significant epidemic in the African-American community, and it returns in some of the gay men in the West Coast and elsewhere. It's on, in parts, it's on the rise again. But in African-Americans in the cities of the East Coast of the United States, it's still a very serious epidemic. The biggest need for therapy continues to be sub-Saharan Africa. Other high infection rates, I already mentioned, some of the American cities, some parts of Eastern Europe. A vaccine is still not developed. We have a candidate sponsored by the uh, Gates Foundation that will go into the clinic uh, in about five, six months from now. Uh, and uh, do I think it's going to work? I think it's important to do clinical trials to show safety, but we know there are problems of having the antibodies last sufficient periods of time. That's a problem for the field in general. It's not the variability of the HIV that causes us the problem. It's this darn integration problem. So we have more basic science to be done. Okay, now let's move on to some other things. I, I, I should welcome my sponsor. Azad, I, I should say, I, I thank my sponsor. That was you. You weren't here at the beginning, so I didn't mention it, but now I will. <laughs> okay. So, an issue is, could we have done better? The late Jonathan Mann of the WHO said that HIV AIDS research was the fastest progress in the history of medicine from the beginning of a new disease, a mysterious new disease, cause unknown, very mysterious. So, we knew the beginning of the disease in 1981. When Jonathan Mann made his statement, it was 1985. Well, what did he mean by that statement? We found the cause, we developed a blood test, all the genes of the virus were sequenced the first time an infectious agent, we had the full genomic sequence. We knew all the proteins, we knew its target cells, we knew how it was transmitted, we knew the epidemiologic risk factors, and therapy for the first time in the history of virology began to be developed. Indeed, that was very impressive. But I believe that though we were technically prepared, we were not prepared conceptually. There were no expert medical virologists who were, in fact, responsible. Why do I say that? What about WHO? WHO does not have laboratories. And if something is new, they don't know who to turn to, or they can't know. So you can comment that the American Center for Disease Control, or CDC, was there. This is true, and they are very good. But there are two weaknesses of the CDC. One, they are a government-based agency. And sometimes some countries don't want to deal with that. They don't want an American government agency solving their problems, taking their samples, etc. But even if that were not a problem, the CDC has responsibility for everything. Pollution, chemicals, bacteria, fungi, parasites, every virus. Also accidents, seatbelts. It's too much. So it meant that CDC at the time did not have expertise in retroviruses. How did we get involved? How did any laboratory that made contributions in those early years get involved? We got involved by chance, by a whim. I heard a lecture and I thought, yeah, it's interesting. It was a challenge. Maybe I should try to do a little something. So at the beginning we tried with one finger out of 10 and then we got more and more involved. It should not be the case. There must be responsible, expert, medical, virologists covering with expertise every kind of virus known to man that could infect us and cause disease in us. I gave a lecture called the James Joyce Lecture. You will, we may know James Joyce was a great Irish author. So this lecture was in Dublin, Ireland. And I made this point because it was a public audience. I made this point that we could have done better and I mentioned that we really need viruses, virologists, trained experts connected to each other. And I finished the talk and these two big Irish guys came down to talk to me and they said, well, professor, you know, you're talking a good game, but what the hell are you doing about it? So I, I said, what can I do? I'm only one laboratory. But it made me think. And that evening, my thoughts turned to the possibility that we could make a global virus network or GVN. 
And that's the story now to go into for the rest of the talk. The origin of the Global Virus Network, I've already given it to you. Early days of the AIDS pandemic, CDC AIDS Director James Curran, now the Dean of Emory University in the United States, was looking at me and he said, where are the virologists? So he was already thinking of a new virus, but there were many, many theories as to the origin of AIDS. But that statement got me into the field, just by chance. The world needs assurance of available, each word is important, available expert responsible viruses that cover the full range of pathogenic viruses. They should be available for consulting to governments, available for the consulting to NGOs, to hospitals, etc. And when needed, they should be available for active research. They should be also deeply involved in the training of future medical virologists, which, strangely enough, medical virologists are on the decline in numbers in most areas of the world. The threat of outbreaks is constant. Again, you heard a lecture, a nice lecture on influenza A and B, so I'm not going to say more about it. But influenza is a danger every year of a potential serious epidemic. You never know how bad it's going to be. You all know the stories of SARS. China was not prepared. Today, China would be prepared because there's a GVN and a significant one in China. But if the Chinese GVN does not have expertise, in respiratory viruses of a new kind and didn't know what to do, the global network would provide expertise that quietly would help the Chinese, and the Chinese GVN could then help their government. It doesn't have to be any awkwardness or embarrassment that you're relying on another country if you have your own GVN center. You know the recent outbreak of MERS. Needless to say, you know about Ebola, and I'll come back to it. Dengue, norovirus, chikungunya, HIV, a great number of encephalitis viruses, a great number of hemorrhagic fever viruses, not just dengue. This is the declaration made at the beginning of the Global Virus Network. It was held in the Italian Embassy in Washington, D.C. And people, including people from Russia and China, signed an agreement that this would be free from government control. So look at the bottom part. Seeking to improve the immediate responses to emerging viral threats, to train future generations of medical virologists, to advise governments or non-governmental organizations on virus diseases and threats and their control. It fills a critical need in international health for today and into the future. Now, I don't want you to think that the GVN is a surveillance. We're not big enough nor funded to become a surveillance to find out what's cooking all over the world. Rather, once the surveillance indicates there's a new problem, that's where the GVN enters. It's in between, let us say, WHO and the final solutions. So that was the beginning. The mission, again, to strengthen medical research in response to current viral causes of human disease, to prepare for new, new viral pandemic threats or epidemic threats, local threats, it meets its mission three ways. Support cutting-edge research and training, provide authoritative information to the public and to the policymakers about viruses, vaccines, and treatment, and advocate for resources for medical virology worldwide. For instance, what if Ebola came to India import in a significant way tomorrow to a heavily populated region. That would be a little frightening, right? But there are vaccines available now. It's not really that known in the newspapers. There are good vaccines. Ebola is not a complicated virus. The vaccines should work. They work in monkeys. They work well, at least several, three of them that I know of. And the GVN could tell you, take that vaccine, not this one. And what's the delay right now? The delay is that nobody licensed the vaccines because there wasn't any market for it. But governments, if GVN in the future are more aggressive, should say government...